to say it was so nice to walk into the department and see the big poster that says FOO in the middle, because that's the stuff that I love. Um, observe the very large sturgeon on this slide. And here is me doing yoga in front of the Sphinx. Um, so just to reiterate a little bit about myself, I graduated 10 years ago, roughly, from this department. And uh, my focus is on historical archaeology, zooarchaeology, and food anthropology. And I've been working for those past 10 years for AECOM, which is a worldwide engineering company. Um, the office that I work for is located in Burlington, New Jersey, but I do my research in the zooarchaeology lab here in this building. Um, the project that I am working on and have been working on that entire time for the most part is the I-95 project. Um, and this is an image of the Smart Report website for the I-95 project, uh, which I encourage you at some point to go check out for yourself. I'll give you a little bit more information about that project. So it consists of excavations in advance of improvements and expansion of the I-95 highway. And eventually the project will span 20 years and will be the largest archaeological ex excavation in the United States. So it's going to run all the way from Port Richmond in the north to the Navy Yards in the south. At this point, over 1.2 million artifacts have been recovered from the excavations. And those excavations are currently focused on the neighborhoods of Northern Liberties, Kensington, Fishtown, and Port Richmond. Like most archaeological work in this country, investigations for the I-95 project are mandated by the National Historic Preservation Act of 1966. Uh, this law requires archaeological in investigations to be completed whenever construction projects receive federal funding. This SMART report um, makes use of the latest SMART technology, so visitors to the site can search through and explore the information as they please via their computers or any handheld web-enabled device. And the kinds of things that you will find at this site include images, 3D reconstructions, information about individual artifacts, historic research about these neighborhoods, stories about the diverse people who made the riverfront their home over the past 5,000 years or more, detailed reports of discoveries from individual archaeological sites, and then artifact databases that can be used for further research. Here you can see the neighborhoods, Northern Liberties, Kensington Fishtown, and Port Richmond. All right, so I analyze almost all of the animal bones that come from the I-95 project, and they generally consist of the following species. In terms of mammals, cows, pigs, sheep, and some very occasional deer. In terms of the birds, chickens, ducks, turkeys, geese, pigeons, and a few other wild bird species. And then for fish, catfish, shad, white and yellow perch, black sea bass, corgis, and sturgeon, which we're obviously going to dive deeper into here. And then there are several different varieties of turtles and an occasional snake. I am personally interested in animal bones in archaeological contexts as a window through which to explore the food landscape and food habits of people living in the past. So I use the bones to think more deeply about these topics and then follow the evidence that I find in the bones through historical research to learn more. And I use documents like newspaper articles and advertisements, diaries, cookbooks, both printed and manuscript, household manuals, and account books. In the faunal record, the sturgeon scoots, which is the bones that you see here, these are called scoots, uh, always stand out amongst the crowd. They are morphologically quite different than other fish bones that I see, um, and they are very sturdy. So um, actually, some Native Americans use them as like graders. They can be this big or even larger, um, you know, the size of a palm and, and get even bigger than that. Uh, so they, they can be used because they are sturdy for things other than just like eat the fish and toss the bones. And here's a, an image so you can just see the orientation of those scoots, which are here in the body. They kind of uh, function as a sort of armor for the fish. And then you can also see that the skull at the front end uh, is very sturdy. I personally have not seen the skull archaeologically. 
So let's dive into the story of the surgeon. And I will say that um, I rely heavily on this talk, in this talk, on um, historical writing because I think that it really fleshes out the story, the way that people wrote, and exactly how they said things. And so I will be quoting a lot from historical sources, which I personally find to be extremely entertaining. Um, so we'll start with the biological history of the fish. The sturgeon is amongst the oldest fishes in the world. The family of fish that the sturgeon is from, Asapensuridae, dates back to the Cretaceous period, more than 120 million years ago, meaning that these fish were around when dinosaurs were flourishing. They can grow to 16 feet in length and can weigh over 800 pounds, although a more standard range of size is 6 to 8 feet and less than 300 pounds. Because of their strange appearance and large size, they have gotten the nickname Frankenfish. Uh, in terms of the name of sturgeon, there is some dispute as to how the sturgeon got its name. Some say that the name comes from its great size, from the Teutonic word stur, S-T-U-H-R, meaning great. Uh, the Teutons were a Germanic tribe or Celtic tribe mentioned by Greek and Roman authors, so they are a Germanic people. <coughs> Others say that it is called sturgeon because as a bottom feeder, it stirs up the mud as it swims. And still others claim that the fish got its name from the German verb storen, meaning to wallow in the mud. So the life cycle of the sturgeon is a very long life cycle. Sturgeon are uh, anadromous, meaning that they migrate from coastal ocean waters to rivers in order to spawn or to release or deposit their eggs. And they exhibit something called homing fidelity or natal homing, meaning that they will live and grow in marine waters, but they will return to the rivers in which they were born to spawn, which is pretty cool. Juvenile fish stay in the brackish or slightly salty mixture of river and ocean waters in which they hatched for varying amounts of time. Subadults primarily use marine habitats during the winter and rivers, estuaries, and coastal marine habitats during the summer. Although the sturgeon usually cruise slowly and quietly along the bottom of sandy or muddy stretches, they are strong swimmers and sometimes leap out of the water. And we will discuss a few examples of this later. Sturgeon spawn in either fresh or brackish waters over hard clay, rubble, gravel, or shell, usually in fast-moving water in the spring or early summer. And the age at which spawning first occurs varies by location, with fish spawning at younger ages in the south. In the northeast, female sturgeon usually spawn for the first time when they are around 20 years old, for the Atlantic sturgeon specifically. Uh, although sturgeon may live to be 50 or 60 years, sometimes even older than that, they do not reach sexual maturity until somewhere in the range of 15 to 20 years of age. As you can imagine, due to the late sexual maturity of the sturgeon, once the fish <coughs> became desirable as a food source and therefore heavily fished, the population was rapidly decimated. Sturgeons continue to grow for as long as they live at a rate of roughly five inches per year. Females may lay 800,000 to 3.7 million eggs in a single year. And they do this every two to six years. Males spawn every one to five years. Sturgeon eat prey found on the bottom, such as mussels, worms, and shrimp. So now I'll talk about different varieties of sturgeon. There were and are two different species of sturgeon in the waters around Philadelphia, the Atlantic sturgeon and the short-nosed sturgeon. So the short-nosed sturgeon grow approximately 4.5 feet long and can weigh up to 60 pounds, uh, and they have been recorded to live 30 years or more. They are yellowish-brown with a black head, back, and sides, and bellies that range from white to yellow. They have five major rows of scoots. The short-nosed sturgeon are similar in appearance to the Atlantic sturgeon, but can be distinguished by their smaller size, larger mouth, smaller snout shape, and the scoots. Short-nosed and Atlantic sturgeon live in rivers and coastal waters from Canada to Florida. They hatch in the fresh waters of rivers and spend most of their time in the estuaries of these rivers. Unlike Atlantic sturgeon, short-nosed sturgeon tend to spend relatively little time in the ocean. They do not, uh, when they do enter marine waters, they generally stay close to the shore. For the most part, historical landings records fail to differentiate between the short-nosed sturgeon and the larger Atlantic sturgeon, making it difficult to determine historic trends and abundance for the population of either of these species. 
Today, the short-nosed sturgeon is in danger of extinction throughout its range and is listed as an endangered species under the Endangered Species Act. While the short-nosed sturgeon are rail rarely the target of a commercial fishery, uh, or were rarely the target of a commercial fishery, they were often taken incidentally, frequently mistaken for the juvenile or immature Atlantic sturgeon in the commercial fishery, fishing for Atlantic sturgeon. And then for the Atlantic sturgeon, they are slow growing and late maturing, and as I've mentioned, can reach up to 16 feet in length, up to 60 or 80 years in age, and can weigh up to 800 pounds. They are a bluish black or olive brown on their back with paler sides and a white belly. And they also have five major rows of dermal scutes or thorny plates along the length of their body. The Atlantic sturgeon were once found in great abundance, but their populations have declined greatly due to overfishing and habitat loss. Atlantic sturgeon were prized for their eggs, which were highly valued as quality caviar. During the late 1800s, people flocked to the eastern United States in search of caviar riches from the sturgeon fishery, and this was known as the black gold rush. By the beginning of the 1900s, sturgeon populations had declined drastically. For example, close to 7 million pounds of sturgeon were reportedly caught in 1887. By 1905, the catch declined to only 20,000 pounds. And then by 1989, only 400 pounds of sturgeon were recorded as being caught. Atlantic sturgeon historically could be found in all of the major river systems along the Atlantic coast between Florida and Canada but the Delaware River has the largest population. Various populations of Atlantic sturgeon today are considered to be either threatened or endangered. So here's uh, some information about the uses for the different parts of the sturgeon. So first we'll talk about sturgeon meat, and there were essentially three different methods for preparing it. The first was a method of salting. The fish was cut into long pieces, salted, and then hung to dry in the sun. The second was a method for pickling, and in this method, the fish was cut crosswise into short pieces and then placed in small barrels where a pickle was added. Pickle being something usually vinegar plus some spices, salt. The third method was smoking the sturgeon. And all of these methods keep and travel well, thus lengthening the saleable life of the sturgeon flesh. Sturgeon became a much more viable commodity once the <coughs> preservation techniques were implemented. Sturgeon oil was used as a substitute for whale oil in oil lamps as it has a less smoky flavor and does not spoil as quickly. And it was also used for soap and margarine. The swim bladder, which is an internal gas-filled organ that contributes to the ability of many bony fish to control their buoyancy and thus to stay at their current water depth without having to waste their energy constantly swimming. So this swim bladder was used to make isinglass. And it was also used in paint as a binding agent, as an adhesive, and was considered to be one of the finest animal glues available because it has no particular smell or taste. It produces a nearly pure gelatin and was used for thickening soups and sauces as well as in making beer and wine more transparent. Even the skin of the sturgeon could be tanned and made into leather. And of course the sturgeon eggs or roe were put through a salting process to become caviar. And then here's just a more complete sturgeon uh, skin that's <coughs> turned into that leather. Uh, this one is from a Delaware River sturgeon. Archaeological evidence indicates that prehistoric native inhabitants relied on Atlantic sturgeon in their seasonal eating strategy. Atlantic sturgeon helped to save the starving colonists at Jamestown, who discovered that the giant fish were a reliable food source much of the year. Captain John Smith wrote, quote, We had more sturgeon than could be devoured by dog and man. During colonial times, most people considered sturgeon a nuisance and a trash fish. Certain accounts state that sturgeon were so plentiful they actually clogged rivers during their spawning runs. Large sturgeon that were caught accidentally by fishermen were either discarded, fed to pigs, used as fuel to power steamboats, or used for fertilizer. Caviar was so common and considered relatively useless that it was simply given away. Beginning in the mid to late 1800s, North Americans became aware of the value of sturgeon. 
Europeans considered caviar a delicacy, and so the demand for sturgeon exploded when preservation techniques for shipping were perfected. Sturgeon became haute cuisine in the 19th century. Its nickname, Albany Beef, was due to the sturgeon's bright red colored flesh resembling premium quality beef. The white portions were also passed off as veal, and many cookbooks refer to the taste and preparation of sturgeon as being similar to veal. Sturgeon meat was described as noticeably similar to the white parts of veal in terms of the appearance of the flesh when both fried and raw, and to the taste. Slices of sturgeon could be prepared just like a veal cutlet. Although it was generally eaten pickled or smoked, the flesh of the sturgeon most resembles veal when it is roasted. The fish is very meaty, and it's said that the sturgeon pies are barely distinguishable from meat pies. In the 1850s, immigrants began to arrive from Russia and Eastern Europe in some parts of this country, and these new settlers were used to catching Atlantic and beluga sturgeon in the Baltic Sea, and they brought with them a knack for cooking and an appetite for caviar. The foundation of the business was laid, and sturgeon sometimes found their waterways blocked by the treacherous nets and anchors of homesick travelers longing for a taste of the motherland. Initially, sturgeon were not a highly prized or often eaten fish in the Delaware River Valley. In the 1832 Encyclopedia Americana noted that, quote, it is sometimes brought to the Philadelphia market, but the majority that are taken in the Delaware are left to rot along the shores. During the early days, sturgeon were often caught in shad nets and were treated more as a nuisance than as a food source because their large size put a strain on the nets and they would break. At this time, the short-nosed sturgeon was considered more palatable and desirable in the fish markets of Philadelphia. The abundance of sturgeon in Pennsylvania was recorded very early on by the colony's founder, William Penn. He wrote, quote, nor had the creator been less mindful of the waters in that great country, for they were made to bring forth abundantly of fine fish of various kinds, especially the sturgeon, of which the great rivers were so full that at no time could we look on it without seeing numbers of those great fish leaping from it into the air, not without much fright to the natives, whose canoes they have many a time fallen into and overset. <laughs> Sturgeon are known for leaping, oftentimes landing on unsuspecting victims, who have reported a wide variety of injuries. <coughs> Many sturgeon uh, leap, or why sturgeon leap is one of the mysteries of the fish world. The incongruity of sturgeon breaching was noted by one observer in 1731 who wrote, quote, in May, June, and July, the rivers abound with them, at which time it is surprising, though very common, to see such large fish elated in the air, by their leaping some yards out of the water. This they do in an erect, erect <coughs> posture and fall on their sides, which repeated percussions are loudly heard some miles distance. Some speculate sightings of sturgeon have given rise to such le legends as the Loch Ness Monster and Champ of Lake Champlain. Now I'm gonna read an excerpt about sturgeon from the journal Forest and Stream um, from which was published in New York in 1900. The shad fishers and boat, river boatmen used to have some exciting times with the sturgeon, and both hated each other with equal hate. If a lusty young sturgeon got the chance to tear a shad net, he took it. Or if a boatman had the opportunity to smash a sturgeon gently over the nose with a boat hook, he accepted the opportunity with equal alacrity. It was not un an uncommon thing for a sturgeon to become entangled in a shad net which was full of shad. The big fish would not pay attention to the tiny meshes at first, but would simply keep away from them, gradually allowing himself to be pulled nearer and nearer to the shore. All of a sudden, it would dawn upon him that he was in a trap, and with a swish of his tail, he would start for deeper water. The net met his rush and perhaps stopped him at first. Then he would swim back a little way and charge the meshes like a torpedo bolt at full speed. The net always gave way before his three or four hundred pounds of weight going 40 or 50 miles an hour, and the shad followed the sturgeon. The fishermen only landed a good haul, haul of profanity and put the rest of their day in mending the broken sen. <laughs> sturgeon ran large in the river 20 years ago. This is 20 years ago from 1900. And none of the 200 or, and 50 or 300 pounds were frequently taken. The meat was a bit gamey, but not unpleasant to taste, and that of the smaller fish was nice. 
They are a lazy fish and lie around upon the sandbars, much like the pickerel. And they are about as gamey. On their back is a row of scales that are about as tough as the average armor plate on a battleship. And their noses are similar to a battering ram. The mouth is on the underside of the head, in much the same position as that of a shark. And the sturgeon, even in evening dress, is not handsome. <laughs> the end of the snout is a ball of gristle, and this was much prized among the children who dwelt along the banks of the river. The gristle was dried and used as a ball, and would bounce many feet into the air, being much more elastic than rubber. It was the boatmen who suffered the most harrowing adventures with the sturgeon. It seems that a boatman was always on the lookout for the fish when going over the shoals. One voracious man relates an experience that he had while on a trip upriver from here. He was looking over the rail and saw a sturgeon sunning himself in the water. There was an axe in the boat near the man, and grabbing this instrument of war, the man made a leap for the fish. The sturgeon saw him coming and started to run, but in his hurry, he headed for shallow and not deep water. The man followed. The sturgeon watched him for an instant and then saw that it was time for him to do something. He charged for the man. The fisherman, fisherman gasped, grasped his axe and cursed himself for jumping overboard, but resolved to die anyway. When the fish got to within six feet of him, he was swimming about a thousand miles an hour, according to the man. <laughs> the fish swerved to one side and the man hit him one with the axe. The sturgeon did not wait to see how badly he had been hurt, but sought solitude and deep water. The man got back on the boat and has not toyed with a, sur a sturgeon since. <laughs> and, and another boatman had a bit more trying experience in jumping overboard for a sturgeon. He was standing in the bow of a boat and saw a fish just under him. And he jumped at him and came down astride his back. The sturgeon was somewhat surprised at this and started to move. So the man threw his arms around what would be the sturgeon's neck if he had one. But unfortunately, the man's fingers got caught in the gills of the fish. This proceeding somewhat shocked the sturgeon, and he closed his gills, thus catching the man's fingers so firmly that he could not pull them out. Then the fish began to swim, and swam for a record. The man was stretched out on his back and going through the water like a railroad train. The sturgeon started for deep water and got there. The man went into it with him, and found it a bit difficult to breathe under 10 feet of Connecticut River water. The sturgeon also remembered that he wanted a little air and opened his gills. This let the man's fingers out, and rising to the top of the water, he swam back to his boat. <laughs> no thanks. <laughs> uh, this is a recipe from the Farmer's Cabinet and American Herd book for sturgeon pie, and it's a sturgeon fertilizer recipe. So this book was published in uh, 1841 and gives you an indication that at that time period sturgeon were not valued. So they actually put half a dozen sturgeon whole in a hole. So they like caught them and they were like, okay, they got a fish, and then they just buried it. And then they eventually churned it up and used it as fertilizer, but they definitely were not eating it in this recipe. So they were pretty expendable still at this time. Um, there were a few scattered attempts at sustaining sturgeon fisheries in several localities across North America, but the prejudice against sturgeon precluded the successful development of a reliable market that could support an industry until after 1850. With that said, it is most likely that the Delaware River sustained the first permanent sturgeon fishery. A permanent sturgeon, in, permanent sturgeon industry started to take hold along the Delaware River about 1830 near, near Bristol, Pennsylvania and Bordentown, New Jersey. These early fisheries were not very profitable because sturgeon were being sold for anywhere from 12 and a half to 30 cents each. And you should kind of keep those numbers in your mind for later comparison, 12 and a half to 30 cents. Nevertheless, its proximity to Philadelphia and New York, where uh, there was a large enough foreign population and lower classes willing to eat the sturgeon, allowed the industry to stumble along until about 1860. The practice of smoking sturgeon took hold in about the 1850s, and people began to purchase it as a good substitute for smoked halibut. This created more of a consistent demand for the fish. And in addition, there was a growing wagon trade where peddlers would carry the fish on carts outside of the city into the countryside. And then Sturgeon Row were finally being sold as caviar. There are historical references to the fact that there was a fishing center in Trenton, New Jersey that was packing sturgeon in barrels 
prior to the Revolutionary War, from whence they would be shipped to New York and Philadelphia by a team of oxen. Astonishingly, at this time, sturgeon roe, which were used to make caviar, was regarded as practically useless and fed to hogs or used as bait for other fish. Sturgeon in England belonged exclusively to the king. This is perhaps why early colonists were not too enthusiastic about it. It had formerly been off limits. In fact, they thought ill of the Native Americans for consuming it, like the Native Americans knew. <laughs> sturgeon were a foodstuff primarily reserved for the poorer classes, including servants and slaves. The local spawning season was May and June, and during these months, the Delaware River was banked by cleaning stations, and sturgeon were sometimes landed by the thousands. At a sturgeon factory in 1867, a catch of 15 to 20 sturgeons a day was considered a fair daily catch. They were caught in drift nets. And here's a quote. <coughs> the fish are taken alive to the factory and placed in a pen of logs and anchored in deep water in the creek. From this pen, a certain number are taken every day and killed, just as a butcher would kill cattle for market. A note in the newspaper, the Delaware County Republican, on June 18th of 1869, noted, quote, the business of sturgeon fishing is carried on to a considerable extent in this locality. There are at present over 20 nets engaged in the business. It goes on to say that sturgeon are most in demand in Philadelphia and New York. Much of the sturgeon caught at this time was for export. In fact, 90% of the sturgeon catch from the Delaware River in 1869 was shipped to New York to be canned and exported. And here's an article on sturgeon fishery from the Philadelphia Public Ledger newspaper in 1860. Within a few years, sturgeon fishing in the Delaware has become an important branch of industry. The demand for the meat has increased so much that a large number of men and about 50 boats are engaged in it. The fish are caught in nets, drawn on board with hooks. Sturgeon are now caught in the Delaware from Cane's Point to the lower part of the bay, and it is estimated that a thousand are brought per week to the Philadelphia market. They are sold to men who skin and cut them and supply the city trade. The meat retails from three to four cents the pound, while beef brings from 10 to 16 cents. So you can see why you might buy the sturgeon instead of the beef, it's much more cost effective. Properly cooked, the eat, the eat is very good and in some quarters esteemed a luxury. By 1880, sturgeon was an established part of the fishing industry along the Delaware River, as well as other regions of the United States. There was a small but growing market for sturgeon meat and the manufacture of isinglass from the bat bladder, most potent of all, the increasing European demand for caviar. Where in 1860, the sturgeon had supported only a tottering industry combined largely to the Delaware River region, the year 1880 marked an industry widespread in its range and yielding nearly 12 million pounds of sturgeon per year. The height of the sturgeon industry in the Delaware River came in the 1880s when there were hundreds if not thousands of people who flocked to the fishing camps along the river. By this point, the sturgeon was so highly prized and sought after that a single good catch of fish could provide a year's worth of income to the fishermen. For the period 1880 to 1900, the countrywide annual yield of products from sturgeon did not dip much below 11 or 12 million pounds. In 1888, the Delaware River and Bay fishery produced over 6.4 million pounds of sturgeon product, which was ostensibly less than the amount fished in the previous year. The increasing demand for caviar in European markets, especially Germany, was a big impetus for the sturgeon industry and was really the reason that it became so profitable. So you can see the trajectory of the industry. In the mid-1880s, fishermen were hauling 726,000 pounds a year, by 1904, this number dropped all the way down to 163,000. So from 726,000 to 163,000 in 24 years. And then in 1920, a measly 23,000 brought in. Here is a um, article from the Philadelphia Evening Public Ledger in 1940. And it says, closed season for sturgeon proposed. Hugh M. Smith, Chief of the Bureau of Fisheries, has recommended to Secretary of Commerce Redfeld that every state in whose water sturgeon existed prohibit their capture for sale for a period of at least 10 years. 
Owing to the decimation of the schools of breeding fish and to the peculiarities in spawning habits, it has been found impossible to inaugurate a sturgeon culture anywhere in this country, said Commissioner Smith. Attempts at artificial propagation have proved utter failures whenever tried. The expenditure of considerable money has sometimes failed to yield a single batch of eggs suitable for incubation. A possible relief may be afforded through the transplanting in our waters of young sturgeon from other countries. A supply of young fish of a very desirable species inhabiting the Danube and the Caspian Sea has been offered by the Romanian government. These larger and inoffensive fish of our seaboards, coast rivers, and interior waters were for years considered to be not only valueless but nuisances. And whenever they became entangled in the fishermen's nets, they were knocked on the head and thrown back into the water. Even in the present generation, we have seen the shores of the Potomac River in the vicinity of Mount Vernon lined with the decomposing carcasses of these magnificent fish, witnesses to the cruelty, stupidity, and profligacy of man. The same thing is being observed everywhere in the country. <coughs> when fishermen awakened to the fact that the eggs of the sturgeon were valuable as caviar and the flesh as food, another senseless chapter in the history of this fish was written. There followed the most reckless and senseless fishing imaginable, with the result that a comparatively, in a comparatively few years, the best and most productive waters were depleted, and what should have been a, made a permanent fishery of great profit was destroyed. Even after the great value of the sturgeon began to be appreciated by everyone, the immature and unmarketable fish, incidentally caught in sends, gill nets, and pound nets, received no protection whatever in most waters and were ruthlessly destroyed as nuisances, the decline of the sturgeon being thus doubly accelerated. For example, on the Atlantic coast, the catch of sturgeon fell from 7 million pounds to less than 1 million pounds in 15 years. On the Pacific coast, a catch of over 3 million pounds annually in the early 90s was followed by a few hundred thousand pounds in later years of the same decade, with no improvement since then. On the Great Lakes, the yield declined more than 90% in 18 years. In the American waters of the Lake of the Woods, one of the most recent grounds for the exploration of the sturgeon, the catch decreased over 94% in 10 years, notwithstanding a more active prosecution of the fishing. The sturgeon fishery in American waters as a whole reached its climax in about 1890. For two or three years, the annual catch was 12 million to 15 million pounds. At the present time, the annual yield does not exceed 1 million pounds, and everywhere there is a steady downward trend in the catch. The scarcity of sturgeon and the demand for their eggs and flesh have run up the price to an extraordinary figure, never attained by any other fish, either in America or elsewhere. A mature female sturgeon often brings the fisherman $150, and it is a poor fish that cannot be sold for $20 or $30 on the rivers of the East Coast. Do we recall the 12 and a half cents from earlier? Here's an excerpt from the journal <coughs> Scientific American in 1894 about the sturgeon industry. There promises to be a big run of sturgeon this year, and that means a great deal to the dealer in caviar. The caviar sandwich has now become so popular in the United States that the supply is scarcely equal to the demand. As is known, the black fishy paste that is now the fad between pieces of bread at late suppers is made of sturgeon eggs. In order to add to the fashion, nearly all of the little kegs of caviar have borne Russian or German labels, but they all come from this side of the Atlantic, and most of them originated in the Delaware Bay. Rebranding. <laughs> Bayside is the main shipping point. That it pays the fishermen to work hard at the business will be seen when it is stated that sturgeon meat is worth from four cents to six cents a pound, and a keg of caviar containing about 125 pounds sells readily for $30. Other states have sturgeon fishermen, but in point of numbers, employed and capital invested, New Jersey leads and represents over half of them. The capital invested in the sturgeon and caviar industry in the United States is slightly more than $1 million, and the people employed in round numbers about 4,000. There were there are 12 firms in the lake regions of the West where the fishing is carried on with pound nets and send nets. Outside of New Jersey, the largest amount of capital invested by these lake fishermen is about $325,000. There are only half a dozen firms in New York State engaged in the business. Sturgeon are caught entirely by nets, and the average fish is from 150 to 300 pounds. 
The roe sturgeon brings the fishermen from seven to eight dollars, while a puck is only valued at a dollar to a dollar fifty. The Jersey fleet has 146 boats, and nearly every part of the fish is used. The offal is gathered up and made into fertilizers. Sturgeon oil is extracted from other parts and used by harness makers, but the principal industry is the manufacture of caviar. A good-sized sturgeon will give from three to four buckets of roe. The eggs are separated by running them through a coarse sieve several times and then salted down by a composition of salts, which are made in Germany. It takes from three to four sturgeon to make a keg of caviar. 20 years ago, the sturgeon was so plentiful that the fishermen spent their leisure time killing them. Because of the destruction of smaller fish and the havoc they caused among the shad nets. Now the fisherman's wail is that the sturgeon is becoming so scarce that the industry is threatened. All right, I'll just talk a little bit more about caviar specifically. It is stated on good authority that fully nine tenths of the alleged Russian caviar sold in the markets of, in the United States came originally from American sturgeon eggs. And a good portion of those came from the Delaware River. The 1890s saw a steady decline in sturgeon catches across the US. By 1896, sturgeon flesh reached its high uh, at 12 and a half cents per pound where 15 years earlier it had barely reached one cent a pound, if it were able to be sold at all. In 1882 to four, female sturgeon were sold for $2 a piece at the wharf, and then by 1896 their standard price was 30 to $35 each. Although the sturgeon industry in the Delaware district was clearly on the decline in the 1890s, the region was still very committed to it. The average catch per net, for example, dropped from 60 fish in 1890 to less than 30 in 1896. Despite this drastic decline, there were nearly 1,000 fishermen operating over 150 miles of gill nets, and there were boats, more boats than ever, out there catching sturgeon. By the turn of the century, there were very few sturgeon left in the river. The industry managed to limp along until the 1920s or 30s, at which point it ceased altogether. So, learning a little bit more specifically about the preparation of caviar. This is information coming from a publication in 1873 called New Remedies, published in New York. There are many peculiarities connected with the treatment of the sturgeon rows and their conversion into caviar, and it may be of some service to those interested in the trade to know how it is prepared. Two kinds are made, one fresh or grained, and the other, the hard or pressed. In both cases, the rows are placed upon a web or network with narrow meshes forming a kind of sieve stretched over a wooden hoop. Possibly a fine wire gauze would answer a still better purpose. The fish eggs are forced through the meshes by pressing the whole mass lightly until nothing is left on the upper surface but the cellular tissue, the fat, and the tendons. The eggs fall into a wooden receptacle placed beneath and are not next sprinkled with a very fine salt of the best quality, the mass being stirred with a large wooden fork having eight or ten teeth. At first, the eggs, mixed with salt, exhibit a pasty appearance when stirred, but after each grain is thoroughly impregnated with the salt, the mass swells, and then stirred, there is a slight rustling similar to what would be the case in the stirring of fine particles of glass. This is a sign that the preparation is complete. The caviar is then placed in casks of linden wood, which imparts no unpleasant taste, as might be the case with some other materials. To prepare the pressed caviar, a tub half filled with pickle, more or less strong with salt, according to the temperature of the season, is placed under the network. To secure a thorough impregnation of the eggs, the eggs by the pickle, the mass is stirred with a wooden fork, turning it always from the same side. Then the eggs are strained out, and when thoroughly drained, a quantity of about 100 pounds is placed in a sack and subjected to the action of a press in order to remove all the pickle and convert the whole into a compact mass as curd is converted into cheese. In thus preparing the caviar, a number of the eggs are broken and a portion of the contents runs off with the pickle, so that for each hood, there is a loss of 10 to 12 pounds. After removing the pressed caviar from the box, it is placed in casks holding about 30 poods, the interior of which is lined with napkin cloth, on which account, in commerce, this always bears the name napkin caviar. The better quality of the pressed caviar, that is to say, that which has been less meshed and salted, is placed in narrow cylindrical cloth bags and is then called bag caviar. Caviar is also transported in boxes of tin, hermetically sealed. 
and fresh caviar is always preferred to the pressed, but is much more expensive. Sturgeon in the news. So I'm going to go through a few articles uh, that mention sturgeon, particularly in this area. So the earliest mention of sturgeon being available for sale appeared in the Pennsylvania Gazette in um, 1735, and the advertisement read, Good pickled sturgeon sold by Caleb Elfreth in 3rd Street, either by the large or small quantity. It was also available in the 1740s, where, quote, choice pickled sturgeon to be sold by the quantity at Anthony Wilkinson's in Water Street. Elizabeth Phillips was pickling sturgeon in, quote, the Baltic manner, first at Point Pleasant, New Jersey, and later at Kensington. And she provided these directions in the Pennsylvania Gazette for how to best preserve your sturgeon upon purchase. Quote, when you open the keg, take out the cork and draw the pickle off in a clean pot or pan. Take out the marked head and harden on the hoops, pour the pickle over the fish, putting a clean cloth over the head and the head of the keg upon it with a small weight thereon to prevent the air getting in. If the pickle wastes, add sharp vinegar to it. That was from the Pennsylvania Gazette in 1771. There is some suggestion of counterfeiting since the advertisement goes on to say, quote, that the public should not be imposed upon, the kegs are all marked WP. Ms. Phillips was in the sturgeon pickling business for upwards of 30 years. She sold her pickled sturgeon in Philadelphia by Abraham Smith in Front Street between Market and Arch Streets and by Mr. Joseph Burns in Front Street between Vine and Callow Hill Streets. The fish she sold was either for exportation or for home consumption. Margaret Broadfield in 1768 placed a notice in the Pennsylvania <coughs> Senate informing the public that she, being an esteemed sturgeon curer, intended to leave the area. However, she was, quote, willing to instruct a sober, industrious person or family in the whole art, secret, and mystery of manufacturing sturgeon in the several branches, consisting of making isinglass, pickling, caviar, glue, and oil. And it's interesting to note that judging at least from these newspaper advertisements that women were typically the ones pickling sturgeon and producing it in large quantities. All right, and I also looked at um, books in which there were sturgeon recipes that appeared. So this is Mrs. Rohrer's Philadelphia Cookbook, A Manual of Home Economics. And uh, in that cookbook, there were four different recipes for sturgeon. This is the cookbook from 1886, and those included pickled sturgeon, stewed sturgeon, broiled sturgeon, and baked sturgeon. In case you don't know much about um, Mrs. Rohrer, Sarah Tyson Rohrer, um, she is considered to be the first dietitian in America, and in 1882 she founded the Philadelphia Cooking School, and her <coughs> philosophy of dietetics um, became the cornerstone of her recipes. So she's using food to maintain health, maintain health and treat disease. Her fame spread due to her columns in a Philadelphia-based monthly called Table Talk and uh, in Ladies Home Journal. And by 1895, she became so famous that she gave her cooking lectures at Madison Square Gardens. Uh, the Philadelphia cookbook was the first of over 50 cookbooks that she published. And the recipes are very easy and clear to follow with instructions and familiar lists of ingredients should you like to try them out. So this is a Warren's Model Cookery and Housekeeping book. It was a cookbook published in London in 1879, but it did uh, address some sturgeon details and recipes. There were six recipes for sturgeon dishes, including to roast sturgeon, sturgeon cutlets, to dress sturgeon the Russian way, a Russian sauce for sturgeon, stewed sturgeon, and sturgeon a la Provençale. Sturgeon is, and this is a quote from there, sturgeon is so rare and expensive a fish that it seems useless to give directions for dressing it in an ordinary cookery book. But as no cook can foresee what might fall into her hands to dress, we will not leave her the helpless possessor of a sturgeon. <laughs> the queen's very young fish. For every sturgeon caught in the English rivers is Her Majesty's born vassal, and belongs to her, except those which swim in the Thames below Temple Bar, which belong to the civic chief, the Lord Mayor. The sturgeon is as large as a shark, but has no teeth, and it is a very delicious fish, and may be cooked like veal. 
So this is Cassell's Dictionary of Cookery, published in 1883, and it was published in London, Paris, and New York. There were 22 sturgeon recipes in this book. Um, and in terms of choosing the sturgeon, it says as follows. The flesh of this fish is partly white with a few blue veins, a grain even, the skin tender, good colored, and soft. All the veins and bristles should be blue, for when they are brown and yellow and the skin harsh, tough, and dry, the fish is not good. It has a pleasant smell when in perfection, but a very disagreeable one when bad. It should also cut firm without crumbling. The female males are as full of roe as a carp. And they also give this additional information. The sturgeon is a large fish, somewhat resembling the shark in form. Its body is more or less covered with rows of bony spikes. In the north of Europe, and in some of the states of North America, it is caught in abundance, but it is seldom met with in English rivers. It is said that those who have the good fortune to capture it are bound to send their prize to the reigning sovereign, as the sturgeon is regarded as a royal fish. The flesh of the sturgeon is agreeable and wholesome, and looks something like veal. It, is a, it was so highly esteemed in ancient days that it was crowned before being brought to the table, and a band of music marched before it. <laughs> its roe is converted into caviar, a favorite Russian delicacy, and from its air bladder, fine isinglass is prepared. It is occasionally to be met with in the London market, and generally fetches a good price. Indeed, it is so rare and costs so much that when it is obtained, it is generally dressed regardless of its expense. And then I just have some historic photos of sturgeon in context. So here, uh, I mean, there's a bunch of fishermen crowded around these sturgeon, and they're going to be skinning the sturgeon. So these two photos, there's landing a sturgeon on the wharf in Bayside, New Jersey, and then there's a carcass of sturgeon ready for shipment in the same um, fishery. And here's a quote of a, a poem by George Pyle, written in 1920 about sturgeon. As I sit alone in my cabin, thinking of days gone by, when sturgeon and shad were plentiful and living was not so high, I saw as in a vision that seemed as clear as day Men I had known at Bayside, but long since passed away. This is an image of cutting the row out of the sturgeon on the left hand side and on the right, uh, the refuse from all of the butchery. And here is a um, article from the Philadelphia Public Ledger from 1860. A police out of his ballywick. There was some amusement in Fairmount yesterday created by the attempt of a police officer to capture a sturgeon. A large one, by some accident, had got up the skookle as far as the mill house, and there he surlily attempted to swim up the wastewater into the house. So you can imagine, like, the mill and the sturgeon, like, trying to get in. Every attempt brought him back again into the river. A police officer who probably looked upon these acts of the sturgeon as disorderly and riotous got an eel spear and making a throw pinned the fish in the side. The assault was sudden and the fish, taken by a surprise, darted off into the stream. The policeman held on to the spear and the consequence was he was pulled in head foremost after the fish. For a moment, nothing was to be seen except the boots of the officer. But unfortunately, he was enabled to regain the surface, though without the sturgeon. The crowd that had been witnessing the sport enjoyed the fun hugely, though the police officer could not see where the laugh came in. <laughs> and here's an article from the Philadelphia Public Ledger in 1839. On Thursday last, as three small lads were bathing near Smith's Island, they were alarmed by the appearance of a fish several feet long, which leaped to some distance above the surface of the water and was again immediately submerged. On the following day, the elder of these lads, a youth of uncommon intelligence, was walking with his pap, an eminent ichthyologist of this city, in the neighborhood of the Market Street Wharf, when, on the lower slip in that vicinity, he discovered the same or a similar fish in a dying condition. Having directed his parents' attention to the circumstance, that gentleman ascertained that the fish in question was the short-nosed sturgeon, which is not unfrequently found in the Delaware and abundant in the Hudson. The affair occasioned a good deal of interest at the exchange. And here is, this is an image of a 1,500 pound sturgeon that was caught 
in uh, Snake River, which is near Ontario, Oregon. So that concludes, that concludes my uh, talk about the surgeon, um, but I did want to just give a little bit of background information in case it's useful for anyone here about what it's like to work in CRM as an archaeologist after you get a PhD in anthropology from the Penn Anthropology Department. <laughs> and uh, so how I got that job originally was um, AECOM knew that I was graduating and that I was a zooarchaeologist and they were looking for a specialist in that area. They do tend to hire a lot of um, people who have particular specialties and um, they have a lot of work, you can imagine, with this I-95 project. So um, the, the work, the way it works out for me is basically we ship bones back and forth between the office in Burlington, New Jersey, where they are processed in the lab and prepared. Then they come here, I analyze them, put them into a database, and then when I'm done analyzing whatever they send me, I send it back and we just keep swapping like that. And um, that is most of the time. And then on occasion, and I think like now is, is uh, definitely one of those time periods, the um, people at the Pennsylvania Department of Transportation or someone in, um, higher up involved in the project is like, we need some reports, quick, write some reports. And then everyone rushes into a frizzy and, uh, and we all try to analyze the data and write stuff and put it out there and that kind of comes in waves. So for a very long time, you're just doing all of the analysis, and then um, you're writing a bunch of reports. The problem, well, there are a few problems for me, which is uh, one thing that I've struggled with this whole time as uh, someone who likes to be connected to the historical research and to have um, context for the things that I'm looking at is that because there are multiple people working on different aspects of the project, the historical background information might not get to me until I've, after I've written the report. So I might have no information about who the people are, what the time period is, any of that kind of stuff in order to make the interpretations that I'm making, um, which you know does not lead to the best analytical results. And so I find that to be frustrating, aside from the fact that I really like to do the historical research and there's very little time for that. It's more about uh, crunching the numbers, doing the analysis, and I really love diving into the, you know, the written material, comparing and contrasting it with what the information that we've gotten from the archaeology is and coming up with a more complete and more interesting story as a result of that. And unfortunately, that's not, um, there's not a lot of time or money for that kind of research. That, but with that said, this kind of stuff, it's um, wonderful that we are being able to excavate and have the time, 20 years, to be able to process all of this, which otherwise, you know, on another level might just be bulldozed and we would have no information about all of these neighborhoods where all of this cool historical stuff happened in Philadelphia and it would just be lost to the sands of time. Um, so I think that this research is very important. I, you know, as someone who has worked in an academic environment on this type of research, it is a different piece altogether. What I do working for CRM, uh, I don't find it to be ideal, but I would rather be doing that than it not be done at all. Um, and I do welcome other people who've had experience in, in that realm to, to talk about their um, experience with it as well. So, thank you. So we definitely have time for questions, if you're willing to take them. Does anyone want to start us off? Yeah, um, yeah I just haven't worked myself in this room. No. I was just wondering, as you're talking about all these reports, is since it's such a long uh, duration of the project for 20 years, are there no plans to sort of somehow have like final synthesis kind kinds of reports at the end? You know, where so in other words, you have an opportunity to go back to everything you've analyzed and other interpretations you've made earlier. But now that everything's together, you can actually say something. You know, I sure you know. hope so. I don't know, and I think a lot of it will depend on timing and budget. Um, and also there's a problem that there is turnover in the people who are working there and so and not even consistency on like currently for example myself and someone else who is a trained archaeologist but hasn't done any of the analysis himself like hasn't touched any of the bones but we are simultaneously like divvying things up and writing reports so there you know it would be uh, in an ideal world I hope that's going to happen I mean I think AECOM has pretty high standards, um, and so I, I feel good about the possibility of that, but it is all kind of dependent on timing and money um, at the end of the day. I, I ask also because um, uh, 
you may know, like in the American Southwest and parts of California, there actually are a number of uh, contract archaeology firms that do actually produce really nice reports in the gray literature, just full of all kinds of great interpretations and data and stuff like that. And yeah. they're doing it through their through a contract archaeology. Firm. Yeah, and it's not to say that there isn't that. Um, but because of the, of the scope of the project, that type of stuff tends to be done on a much smaller yeah. scale. And what I'm hoping for is that we can broaden it to, to address everything that's found to say something more profound on that level. There's, I mean, there's definitely like whole stories written about single artifacts and all of that kind of stuff, and like family histories that are really very interesting. Um, but it tends to, it, you know, you've got to pick and choose. And so there's, there is a lot that's lost in that, but there's also, you know, it's great that there is that level of it being done. started out with the sea turtle and then they decimated the sea turtle population then it was like okay now we'll turn to the diamondback terrapin and then they ate a lot of those and there weren't as many around and they're like okay well the snapper's gonna have to do or like this turtle that I just found you know it's not the, the best tasting thing or whatever so I think um, you know largely economically driven by what is available and around but I do think very interesting point about um, would be an interesting project to kind of evaluate the stories about sturgeon as they change over time, and um, you know, like kind of how they're being presented in pop culture, um, and and what that reflects in terms of date and time relationship with the industry and where where that was. That's that's a good point. Hi, um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about how maybe certain regimes of labor are being mapped on to specific ways that sturgeons are being processed. And so I think similar to there's this kind of different valuation of it being a nuisance and then it's a luxury good. Um, I'm wondering if if, um, if that kind of change also maps onto the way that the, the, the processing of the fish changes over time. So you mentioned that women are pickling portions of it. It starts off as a, a yeah, I, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more. Um, I, I honestly did not focus very much on the labor aspect of the industry. I, there are books written about that where you could find out more information, but I'm not, uh, I haven't gotten very deeply into the particular structures and how they might have shifted and changed and like who worked in the industry, you know, was there different classes of fishermen and you know certain ones got to work with certain and, and not others or stuff like that. I'm that I don't don't know any specifics on unfortunately. Sorry. Um, oh sorry, go ahead. Uh, um, along those lines, um, the um, and I know sort of information sharing sometimes in e-com is tricky like you were explaining, but the context that you're looking at, the archaeological context, are those the Processing plans or those sort of the fishermen's can't like is there any sort of like what okay thought I'd ask <laughs> get back to you in 15 years okay. uh, yeah I'm not I don't know okay do you mind kind of building on this actually which is relating back to the archaeology of the I 85 project like do you see these temporal patterns that you can pick up in the historical literature playing out in the archaeological resources like 
that there's a lot of sturgeon at certain points, less at other points, that it's in food waste at certain points and not at food waste at other points. Are you able to see those patterns in the that, archaeology? I don't have that information yet, although I hope to, but I did have a similar project where, working with Shad, mm -hmm. um, where I was looking at not so much temporally, <laughs> but spatially, looking at how Shad were represented in Fishtown, which was where the fishermen lived, um, versus in other parts of the city, and, and looking to see, like, okay, well, we expect there would be more Shad in that area in Fishtown than there are, and that did play out in the, the archaeological evidence. Um, but as of right now, I don't know. I would assume as much, mm -hmm. and if not, that's super cool and I want to know why, mm -hmm. but I'm not to the point where I can actually ask that question. Is there anything about the river regime itself or the way that it's responding to the industrial use or rainfall that would have impacted the whole fishery? I'm sure, because there's more and more industry being built on the rivers and um, you know making the, the water less clean, which is also impacting. But I think that the primary issue was just the overfishing more than anything else. Mm -hmm. And um, actually, Yolong and I were talking just before about how they just really never figured out a way to propagate the sturgeon population. And I think they just didn't have a detailed understanding enough of how to create the right context in which that could happen. I mean, that's how now, for <coughs> endangered species, they're trying to maintain the population in some ways, um, having a, a good enough understanding to actually be able to propagate the species. Um, but at the time, I think more than issues with the riverine environments themselves, although I'm sure that was a contributing factor, I think that just, you know, in the span of 10 years, basically taking the majority of the fish out of the river. I wondered about this because I, I had been thinking, um, you know, all this stuff about the refinery across from Bartram's Garden mm -hmm. sold for some other use. And they said, yeah, well, it's been a refinery. And this got me for 140 years. I thought, wow, that's just the time period that you're talking about mm -hmm. here. I just wondered, you know, uh, clearly it's going to be an interaction. Yeah. Um, but it, it, that struck me as having a profounder effect early than I had anticipated. Yeah, I wouldn't have thought that same. Yeah. So do you have any way of figuring out the relationship between the scarcity issue and you know, the, the price uh, that's being uh, charged and the relationship to that to the you know, uh, status uh, that goes along with the, the diminution in, in the supply? I mean, for sure there is a relationship. I have not come across a good enough historical reference that consistently records what the price is. And I've tried this with other foodstuffs in Philadelphia, even things as simple as beef. I'm like reading through some source and they start mentioning prices per pound and I'm like, okay, great, I'm gonna start recording this and then it's, it's not ever been consistent enough for me to be able to really track it and then map it onto the historical story that I've seen happening. So I, yeah. Yeah, I guess to add to that, I mean, I think the story about the British royalty relationship to uh, the sturgeon uh, reminds me of the fact that in the 19th century is when you see, you know, the spread of English accents uh, being, you know, most pronounced. They don't diminish until mm. really into the 20th century. Hmm. And so I, I wonder whether there are value things that proceed, in other words, the scarcity issue that are going on. I don't know. Yeah, uh, I mean, I'm sure at some level. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, I don't know, because in, in, in New England, I know that uh, David Foster Wallace has written this, and maybe you know, Consider the lobster because mm -hmm. it has a similar kind of trajectory, uh, but it's not clear, you know, what the origins of value were there. You know, mm -hmm. whether they had to do with diminution or some other kind of changes in value. Uh, yeah. Well, it seems like with respect to that, there is that idea that it was like a food for a king, but also that it was like a trash fish. Right. You know, the, 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 those are that's a pretty dramatic swing, not just a. Slight right. change in value, so I think yeah. that would show that, like to me, that's more than scarcity. Like there's something else going on there as well to take that that dramatic, like use them for fuel, or I'm not even allowed to be eating this one because it's only for the king. That seems awfully dramatic. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Thank you for your presentation. 
Do you have enough information looking at the prehistory of the region, of the Native American time period, to, to have a sense for how systematically sturgeon were exploited, and or to what degree they, what 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 part of the diet they might have represented for the communities mm -hmm. who were living along the river? Yeah, I, I personally do not at this point. I think. Probably there's enough data out there from various excavations that I at some point could pull out. There's not a whole lot of Native American contexts that I see. It's mainly the historical stuff. Um, but it would be interesting to try to pull together a lot of the reports, not just from the I-95 project, but other stuff that's been in the area to see how prevalent. And the, I mean. Yeah, I wonder even what kind of historical resources I might be able to find that, that reference that or look into it, but I'm not, I don't have anything at the moment. Justin's shaking his head, too. I was going to say, skews, skews, and it's what, I mean, that, yeah, that's what Justin was getting at, but that's one thing you can see traffic in some ways. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much.